Hello and welcome back to Red Hat Summit and Ansible Fest, day two, our, where you're going to watch the Cube's wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the entire event. We're going to bring on the most interesting speakers, really dive into the announcements, and really peel back what is interesting about those announcements to help you understand. I'm Rob Strecce, I'm joined by Paul Gillen. Rebecca Knight is here floating around, she'll be on real soon too. But right now, we're so excited to have Red Hat's CTO and SVP of Global Engineering, Chris Wright, joining us on the show, right fresh from your keynote. That's Basically, right. you know, a little, a little water, a little hydration in between, but the hike between the two, you know. Yeah. Always getting your exercise. So thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. So I, I think really one of the interesting things that you know, watching the keynote was that, again, Salesforce coming up. I mean, again, I know we were talking a little bit in the lead up. That was like just an amazing client going through and their infrastructure is just massive. It I is, mean, And yeah. it's, they have SLAs on everything. It's got to be up. It's got to be really tight. Uh, CentOS customer, uh, they got to a point where they had to move, right? So they're, they're looking at, okay, do we stay with Red Hat, do we move off? And they chose to stay with Red Hat and move to RHEL 9. Help us understand really where they saw the value of that and the value of sticking it out with Red Hat and really moving into RHEL. Well, I might be a little biased yeah. since, well, since okay. I got a lot of the engineering organization with me, but um, a big part of that, the way, the way they framed it was, strategic partnership. And if you peel that back, the next piece under that was connection to the engineering experts that not only can support something like a com you know, complex tool like an operating system, but are actually the authors of a lot of the content in the operating system. And so they're looking at where do we get that level of expertise so we don't have to build it in house. It's like a perfect, a, a per a perfect partnership, a perfect relationship, and their view was as important as the operating system is, and they're operating at massive scale and doing a mind-numbing number of updates and managing this huge fleet, actually what they want to focus on is the higher level value that they're delivering to their customers so that when they can partner with us, they can just rest easy at night knowing that, that, we're, that we're right there and focus on the things that are most important to them. What kind of resources is Red Hat throwing at this project? I mean, you've got 20,000 20, VMs they're moving over. Well, for us, it's a pretty natural relationship, so it doesn't, you know, we have a very mature platform. Uh, so it doesn't take a huge number of resources. We have a lot of automation and tools that helps uh, uh, customers move content or move workloads from one, uh, one place to another. Uh, you can do in-place upgrades for uh, things like CentOS to, to RHEL 9. So it is um, mostly about that continued long-term relationship and looking, where are we going together in, into the future? They really. Uh, intentional about their technology adoption and think about cloud native technologies and they love this idea about immutable images and image mode for RHEL. It, it really matches their workflow and their needs. So it's not only about what can we do today to help them move, but it's that whole big, that whole big picture. So I, I think that was a great segue into one of my other questions that we kind of chatted about, which is where does image mode fit in the stack for, for customers who are out there trying to understand, okay, do I go bare metal? Do I go you know, something else in between that and OpenShift? How, where, does, where does image mode fit? And yeah. what are the use cases that organizations will thrive on with image mode? The, if you think about an, an operating system and traditional OS, it's RPM based, you update packages. That model fits anywhere. Yeah. Image mode fits anywhere. It's just a different workflow and a different model. So uh, think about building content. Uh, you want to deliver a bootable image to a server. That content will start with the trusted base, the operating system. You're always going to add something in there. It's an agent, it's something that's unique needs from, from your enterprise point of view. Um, if you have a truly immutable image, you can't add that agent in there. And if you're using something like an RPM-based workflow, somewhere somebody's going to log in, do some kind of a package update, and you've now got some kind of drift or, or, or shift from the primary golden image. So that's useful down to the bare metal, which is really critical if you're trying to get direct access to accelerators, you're pushing this out to the edge. But that same image can of course boot in a VM, and that same image can be the base upon which you build your OpenShift cluster. So 
I like to say it's turtles all the way down. It's a, it's a useful tool independent of the, of the use case. Um, now it's a shift in mindset, so you also have to think about the best application is thinking about how you're cloud native, how you want to get to the most uh, simplified and rapid and consistent methodology for deploying content. Yeah. One thing that's been a theme throughout this show is, is AI everywhere, and you're driving AI through all, throughout all aspects of, of uh, RHEL and, and OpenShift and Ansible now. Uh, where do you think the customers are going to see the greatest productivity gains from these, these innovations? AI is touching everything. Um, now, the way we look at it is, it's a critical workload that we want to support on top of our platforms, hence the need to build support for the accelerators down at the bottom of the stack, and something like image mode, you can build this accelerator adapted image so it works well on NVIDIA GPUs, or a different image which will work well on Intel accelerators or AMD accelerators with all the application content going up the stack. So, you know, there's, there's that workload, it's a workload point of view. Then there's infuse it into our portfolio for helping our customers be more productive with our, with our tools. And then that productivity side, are you helping developers write code? Are you helping content authors create other content? Are you bringing debugging skills to do a better job of root cause analysis? I mean, the use cases are innumerable and what we're going through right now as an industry is sorting out where are the best starting points so you show early wins and then kind of keep growing from there. Yeah, I, I think what was really interesting in all the keynotes, and uh, Shesh had his, and where he talked about some of the AI being used, and, I, and we had some really neat uh, discussions yesterday as well around conveyor and app modernization, and you kind of touched on that as well, and you, yeah. you kind of, I, I guess we're, we're told you, you kind of have a, a theory about how that's going to evolve from an app perspective and a model perspective going forward. Why don't you kind of you know, delve into that a little bit about what, is it going to be 100% app modernization or is it, hey, some, you know, I guess you could say, we have the concept of building uh, what we call data apps and these data apps will ha include models inside them that will be part of larger applications and there's kind of a tiering of these as people go to these cloud native applications. How do you see that? How are organizations yeah. thinking about it when you're talking to them? Well, first of all, early stages in the technology, so everybody's at a different point. Some people are just trying to figure out which way is up. Some people are pretty deep into some deployments and really learning. The way I see it is everything we've done to date for enterprises is supporting the development and delivery of applications and enterprises are technology companies, they're software companies, they're differentiating themselves with software. Rolling into the future, AI models are a critical part of an enterprise, and I'd say it's a 50-50 split of applications and models that power the enterprise. And when you look at modernizing applications, which generally means following cloud native principles, landing in a container, you may be doing app modernization and discover that you have a critical dependency. It could be a database or some portion of your application that doesn't naturally easily modernize. You can leave it in a VM and bring that over to a modern platform and run your containerized workloads, your virtualized workloads, your, you know, your AI workloads that need access to accelerators. The application will have integration to the model through just simple APIs. So developers are building intelligence into their applications and that, that's the future of the enterprise. So we're trying to make sure that can all fit on the same platform so you have the same operational experiences and to target the same platform for development. Yeah. That's a pretty big shift. You're going from all applications to half applications, half models. Yeah. How should customers prepare for that, for that world? I love the question. <laughs> so part of it, and it's what I was talking about in the keynote, is one way you can prepare is make sure you lay the right foundation. So build the right platform support for all those different workloads. And then the other way is start bringing in um, experimentation. Uh, you can start as, as small as you need to learn what's valuable for the enterprise in the AI space. And as you discover something that's useful, you got to figure out how to scale it into production. So you start with the experimentation, you figure, you, you figure out how to put that into a repeatable pipeline so you can deliver the model, repeat the model uh, evolution, and make sure that you're maintaining that integration with the application. So it's like start small, find those wins, and then just keep evolving. Yeah, I, I think we, we delved into this at length yesterday, and what I liked, and I, I kind of, 
actually uh, Chris Morgan's uh, demo yesterday with yeah. Mo and the others on stage was fantastic. I, I, I'm like, you should package that up and because it explained yeah, it awesome. in a way that I thought, you know, hey, here's where you start with Podman and Instruct Lab. Here's how you then go to RHEL. Here's then how you go and deploy into production yeah. on OpenShift AI and how you take it across, you know, RHEL AI and all of these different pieces. What I also like about it, and I mean, you know, we're kind of open source wonks, right? We, we, we <laughs> believe open source is the way, I mean, and we loved the Granite open sourcing announcements that were done of the model and of the code assistant. Where do you see it fitting? I mean, I know our perspective, but I want to get your perspective, and I have a funny feeling open is the way, but kind of, how do you see the two working together? Because I think there are, there's the open source alliance, or the AI alliance, which yep. is really pushing on the open source, but then there's government regulations and other things coming. How do you see this all playing out with open source and AI? More open, more better. Yeah. So uh, we're definitely going to keep pushing on that open direction. And as you think about what that enables, uh, the, the broader community support and, and kind of activity you have around a common piece of technology, the more ubiquitous it's accepted in, in, across the industry. So think about something like Linux. It's a de facto standard. Kubernetes, it's a de facto standard. And for one company to try to build a technology that would compete with those, it's just not really possible. The same thing's going to play out in this AI model space. And the other thing that's really important is big, large models are difficult to create. They're expensive to run. And they give you, you know, more data, more parameters, you get better results. You can also fine tune a model, keep it small, efficient to run, produce as good or better results because it's trained on a very specific use case. And I think that's, you'll see that in open source and that proliferation of, of activity. I, I think, in fact, we actually have, we, we back in September, we put out uh, from the research side of things, myself, Dave Vellante, John Furrier, got together and kind of started to look at what was a power law distribution of models, and, and it had nothing to do with revenue or anything like that, it was size of models and uh, addressability to verticals. And so it really big, high models in the front end here where you had like your foundation models, but then stretching out over, hey, I want a customized model for my customer service and in this industry and getting that exact with my intellectual property. Are you seeing customers, I mean, Instruct Lab to me, it, it, the light went off when I learned about it. I actually got a little preview, so I learned about <laughs> it a week and a half ago, and I'm like, wow, I'm like, yeah. this can help you. And there's some other people doing some very interesting thing in synthetic data and stuff like that to help. Do you see that as an enabler to have people more simply fine-tune models? Because I'm, I'm with you, and I think we're all with you, that you know, nobody's going to go compete with you know, Llama 3 and Granite and build their own model. I mean, that just to me is... It's I mean, cost prohibitive, yeah, it's it, very difficult. Unless you're building a service that's going to compete with ChatGPT, which I, I don't know why you would do that. I mean, let, you know, <laughs> that, that's good for them. But I, I look at it as if your service is servicing your customers and your financial services company, do you see that this, I mean, I know it came out of the paper from IBM Labs and it was really, yep pulled together very quickly. We had Matt on talking about how, it, I mean, he got so excited about how quickly it came together yesterday. Yeah. Um, do you see this as a key piece in getting people to models everywhere, to that 50% yes. that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, exactly, and that, that's why I, I put it at that number. There's not going to be one big model that runs the enterprise. Yeah. There's not one big application that runs the enterprise. There's all these little pieces that you compose to run the enterprise. It's the same thing with models, and the difficulty has been, how do you specialize, how do you fine tune? You know, RAG is one tool, uh, but infusing the data directly into the model, reducing the size of the model, it's a really effective way, and it's been hard to do that fine tuning. So making it accessible, that's how you get that proliferation, and that's where you'll see thousands of models, each embedded in an application, providing that application's intelligence. I want to ask you about a project you announced last year, Kepler, an open source project for yeah. measuring the power demands of, of cloud native applications. Of course, huge power demands are AI, ML. How are you uh, evolving Kepler for those new needs? I love that question. 
uh, sustainability is a, a big, it's a big topic. It's especially large in places like Europe where there's regulations and requirements and massive change in, in the energy dynamics in the market. So we have a lot of requests for how can you support visibility into understanding the power consumption of an application. So you can look at the watts consumed at a server level, but that doesn't give you a lot of insight to where those watts are going. So you take an application down view, Kepler gives you that insight. What we've been doing is working over the last year to expand that so it's not just CPU bound workloads like application and business logic, but it's also AI models, which themselves are, are you know, power hungry sitting on, on GPUs. So now you can combine the insights from the application side, the insights from the AI model side to get visibility into your power consumption. And with visibility, you can think of that as like performance. You have a performance SLA, you put it through your CI pipeline and make sure you don't regress. You have an SLA for power. You put it through your pipeline, you make sure you don't regress as you're making changes in your models or your applications. So getting that visibility is key to building more sustainable computing as we go forward. I, I think that, that to me is a great place to leave it because I think to your point, we could sit here and talk about sustainability. <laughs> I, I mean, it's like, I, I think it's, it's the elephant that's not quite in the room in the US yet, but it is definitely in, the, in Europe. Yeah. And I think with the AI Act and some of the other things that are over in Europe and obviously there's a lot more on the sustainability side that they've done there that hasn't quite gotten here. You have the two in California and Virginia, but other yeah. than that, really, you know, not, not there yet. But I, I think that's a great place for us to leave it until next time when we All get right. you on. But uh, thank you for coming on board, Chris. It's always great to get your insights, especially fresh off the keynote. Glad to be here, thanks for having me. Yes, and thank you for starting your day with day two at Red Hat Summit and Ansible Fest, live from sunny Denver. Stay tuned for more coming here from theCUBE, the leader in high-tech analysis and news.